Um, all right. Welcome everyone to our November AMA. I am so thrilled to have a longtime uh, co-conspirator and friend and thought leader and uh, just incredible human being with us, uh, my friend uh, Tiago Forte. Welcome. Hey guys, uh, really happy to finally be at one of these AMAs. I've heard about them for some time. Uh, so yeah, happy to be here. Thanks, Kay. So I'm going to jump in. I have a bunch of questions, but this is really for the community. I'm not going to give your background because everyone knows it. Well, let's not waste time on that. Uh, I'm going to jump in with the elephant in the room. Um, you don't love Notion. You don't hate it. You're kind of like, you're kind of like meh on it. What's, uh, tell us your views uh, on Notion today. Yeah, I mean, first it's my, it's my, my MO is to like kind of rag on something until the moment <laughs> I adopt it. <laughs> you like my wife. As we, were, as we were just talking about with Facebook, I don't know why I do that. Uh, maybe it's to like, like steel man, like make my best case, like, because in general I'm anti, not anti-adoption, but I think people are way too are way too, at least the people that I deal with, which maybe is the, the super productivity nerd crowd, um, are constant, seem to constantly be jumping from one app and platform to another, rather than just like, you know, getting things done, which is the, the real purpose. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but uh, let's see. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think it's, it's a little overblown the hype right now. And I think there's going to be a fall mm. um, because no tool transforms your life like you know, permanently, irrevocably, instantaneously, like people seem to be talking about. And I'm sure like yours and my Twitter feeds are probably totally not representative of anyone else's Twitter feeds. <laughs> um, but uh, I saw a tweet the other day of someone was like, unpopular opinion, top unpopular opinion of 2019. I don't like Notion. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and Superhuman, right? It was like two. There was another one that was Notion and Superhuman. In the yeah, same yeah, time. exactly. They, that's, they that's actually said it, it slows me down, which I was like, I don't know about that. But. Yeah, yeah, totally. So I don't know. I think and it, there, there's something there too with disruption where like, you know, the, the, the model of disruption is that the, the, new, the new person on the block can be sort of automatically better than the incumbent because they're just starting, for, they're starting fresh. Mm -hmm. You know, if I, if I was to make a, a start, a, an app starting today, it would use the latest web framework, the latest UI, you know, best practices, the latest UX things, follow all the trends. And so instantaneously it would go, oh, this is more modern, it's better, it's faster. But, uh, you know, then very quickly you're not the new, the new one and you're just another incumbent. And then I'm sure in the next few months, if not already, we're going to start to see like, oh, this is the new notion. It's even simpler, even faster, even more aesthetically pleasing. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I hear you. Um, is there, I, I, of Notion, because I know you've used it, is there, if you had to look at the feature set, what's like one that's under, underrated or that it's actually like it makes a difference and one that's totally overrated? For, for Notion? For Notion. Um, I mean, the linked databases are going to be big. That's pretty pretty obvious. Mm -hmm. um, I think in some sense, not that it's new not at all. It's just that so often, like, consumer innovations are just something that already existed in business and you needed, like, a mm -hmm. specialist certification to use. <laughs> just cross, cross the threshold to become user-friendly enough. Mm -hmm. So, like, I remember, like, studying, you know, in my community college class in, like, 2000, like, six studying Microsoft access, you know, we had yep. like a, like an MS office class and we would study like, Oh, pivot tables. And you can have these like relational databases and all these things. I think it's very much the same concept. It's just, um, as people's work, gets more complex as people get more sophisticated in what they're willing to do. Then they start like getting curious about these more advanced things. And then those advanced things become simpler. Mm -hmm. so the link databases is pretty, pretty new for consumer software. Yeah. Except maybe Airtable, but even then that always had an enterprise use case feel to it. Yeah. I wonder, I'd be curious what Airtable thinks about all these headline news updates, <laughs> the notion having linked databases, which is like their whole product. Like, I, know. I wonder if they feel like they missed the boat or they, they didn't frame it properly. Cause yeah, Airtable totally does that. And it's totally. a product. Yeah, totally. So that's over our underrated, overrated feature. I mean, the aesthetic, the aesthetics, 
I, I mean, this, this is also classic, like power users never care about aesthetics. Like mm -hmm. the most power users for productivity apps use like command line interfaces that mm -hmm. look like they're from, you know, MS-DOS in the 1990s. Yeah. Um, I'm not even that hardcore. Like there's people that use, you know, Vim and what's the other one? Org mode, Emacs. Emacs. Like, yeah. Way more hardcore than me. Um, I really don't care about aesthetics that much. To the extent it impacts usability, yes. But um, I see people like, there's a screenshot ability that Notion has. Like people post these little dashboards with like little mm -hmm. emojis and little banners and the nice typefaces. I think that probably does some some good for their marketing. But I'm always curious. Like I really want to hear. Like anytime I listen to an interview with a writer, like that I was, you know, that I respect, that that is known for the output. So far, every single one, the most advanced they use is Evernote. I mean, Tim yeah. Ferriss uses Evernote. A lot of uh, well-known writers. I think a lot of that is just because Notion and, and other tools haven't been around very long, but I don't yet know anyone that, that um, uses Notion to say, produce a best-selling book. Yeah. I think that will be a turning point that it's actually being used just as a workhorse, mm -hmm. not as like an experimental thing, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, we could definitely, we could definitely, I have so, some retorts to that, but um, <laughs> I, uh, I, I don't want to hog the microphone. But the other question um, that I have that is unrelated to, to Notion is I shared this tweet and I'm just blown away because I am working my ass off to sell an online course and, you know, eight grand, 10 grand is so hard with a much larger audience than you you know, in terms of my email list. Um, and I'm just blown away that you have generated, you've made half a million dollars in, in top line revenue uh, with, uh, you know, and I'm, I know you, you don't perceive this as being disparaging with a small list, you know, there are media companies that would try to make half a million dollars with millions of subscribers. Yeah. Uh, and you're in the thousand, you know, low 10,000s, high, high, um, high single thousands. Um, and so I want to ask this a more specific question in terms of a lot of people on this calls are, they have either small audiences or no audiences. And they, a lot of them have full employment or f are employed nine to five. How do you, like, what would you tell that person about the first three steps, the first six months, the first, like the early part that's actionable, if they want to go from whatever they're doing now into um, iterating towards uh, uh, some sort of digital product? Yeah, I mean, I, it's a great, <coughs> excuse me, that's a great question. And I, first I want to emphasize, just focus on email. Mm -hmm. Like I, I have this conversation with a lot of people. It's Email is like the secret Trojan horse of online marketing. It's like not sexy. People don't post that much about how many followers you don't, you don't, that's the thing. It's invisible. Yeah. You know, like you and I share some of our numbers. Most people don't. Um, but you see, you know, on Instagram, 50,000, 100,000, 300,000 followers. You see on Facebook, you see on Twitter, it's very visible. Mm -hmm. But that visibility is a function of how easy it is to follow someone on those platforms. And if it's easy to follow them, that means there's not a high barrier to entry. And that means it doesn't, it doesn't count for much. It's just not that, that, that expensive of a signal to hit follow on Twitter or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but if you look at like, I, you know, I've just really come around to this in the past year. If I, if I had focused on email for the past six years, six and a half years, I've been self-employed. My business would be at a stratospheric different level. I mean, I've always treated it as a, as a second class citizen, just, Oh yeah. Like it was hard for people to subscribe for me. They didn't even know where to find it. Um, but then this week I, I, or this, this year, um, in the summer, I did this 10 week, like online course accelerator, uh, with Billy Bross, who you've met. And, um, he showed us some statistics, a lot of case studies, anecdotes, like some numbers that email converts like 11 times better than social media. Mm -hmm. Um, not to mention like every day now there's stories of people getting blacklisted from Twitch, getting kicked off Instagram, violating some Facebook policy. Many times they don't even know why right? You, you do not own that audience. Like it's like, it's like a, that's not a theoretical danger. It's a, in a very real sense, you do not. Mm -hmm. Um, so I've, I'm doubling down on email this year and it's crazy. Like with some small tweaks, like just speaking of how people can start, I never liked the idea of lead magnets, a, a lead magnet also known as a content upgrade is when you basically just give someone incentives to sign up to your email list. You say, you've seen this a million times, I'm sure. Put your email here, I'll send you free content, but you know, right when you subscribe, I'll give you a free download. I'll give you a free 
email series. I'll give you a free PDF, whatever it is. And I, I never liked that because I felt like it was buying subscribers. I was like, if you want to hear from me, sign up. If you don't, <laughs> don't. Like, <laughs> um, but then I, I started looking at the numbers. Like, you know, my, my website gets like, I think in the past year, it had 300,000 visitors, which is like pretty sizable, right? Mm -hmm. And my conversion rate to email was like half of 1%, which is wow. not great. I mean, that's probably industry standard actually, but for someone like me that is like very niche, it's not high at all. Yeah. I added a lead magnet, which was a one page PDF of my Paris system, which is like my most popular thing. Um, so one page PDF summarizing it and that form in the past month that's been live has seven times the conversion. Wow. Seven times as many people signing up. That's, that's um, incredible. I and know. So it's crazy. For that person that's like, well, the, 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 I, I am a big evangelist of uh, support of email as well. And that person typically comes back to me and says, oh, yeah, but you like writing. You're a writer, which right away I'll say, I've only been writing for four years. So I guess I'm a writer for four years. Um, or I don't have a thing. Like you have productivity. Okay. You have, you know, psychology of money. You have a thing that you write about. I don't have a thing. What would you tell that person um, who doesn't think they have uh, a thing to write about on a you know regular basis? Yeah, so a few things. Um, okay, this is really good. Uh, your email list goes, through, it's like a human being. It goes through life stages. Like so, like as many or more as a human does. So first it's a little baby and then it's a, it's a toddler and then it's a, you know, kid and then in a, in a, an adolescent and so on. And, and I've heard, I talked to one guy who has like 500,000 people on his email list. And um, from zero to that, he had to change his email service provider five times, five times. And not because he was like, oh, I like, don't like the color scheme. It was like, it was breaking down. The system was not functional. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's because you just need very different services, you know, from 50 to 100, 100 to 200, 200, 300, you need a whole new class of of reliability um, and it just makes sense that those numbers to do very different things so like with your email list and, and this gets to what people tend to do which is wait to find the perfect tool right even if you somehow do this like meta analysis like pro and con list whatever it is whatever you choose in six months probably won't be the perfect tool so just start <laughs> um, but uh, so in the beginning it's just personal updates you know, when I started my email list, it was like, I mean, I named my company Forte Labs because I didn't even know what I was going to do, mm -hmm. right? I didn't know it was productivity in the beginning. I didn't know. I didn't know. I just said, well, I just want to do a lot of cool stuff. That's kind of like labs. So, and my name is Forte. That, that's the company. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I would just say like this month, this month I'm learning about, you know, productivity systems. This month I'm learning about habits. This month I'm learning on that. And it, this makes sense because in the beginning, the only people on your email list are your friends anyway. <laughs> yeah. it's your colleagues your friends your family and then you start expanding to their friends and it slowly starts going out um and in the in the beginning i would say the draw is you people are people don't care about your products they don't care about your big idea they don't care about your philosophy and your teachings they just care about you they probably have met you they probably know you or know someone that knows you so they're just interested in keeping up with you um and that's where like you know the the the, the growth from say zero or let's say like 10 people to 100 Business-wise, that makes no difference, right? And it's probably people who won't, who won't buy anyway. But as a personal update, you know, most people only keep in touch with 10 or 20 people at all. So you just 10x the number of people that have you in their, on their radar, have you in their periphery, which might not seem like that valuable. It's priceless. Those are people that are going to offer you jobs, send you opportunities, introduce you to people. Like, it's, it's really crazy. Even, like, glancing at Facebook and you see an update from someone, next time you talk to them, what do you say? Oh, are you still doing X? It sticks in their mind, you know? Mm -hmm. I love that. And I would, I, I'd add, I've lived that myself on Rad Reads where if you trace back, it was just like, I was trying to figure out what I do when I quit finance. And then I thought I was going to be a VC. So there was this whole, like, like a lot of AI and FinTech stuff. And then I became obsessed or I've always been obsessed with my own mortality. And there was just like tons of like, like hardcore introspective. And then it morphed into the psychology of money, which is where it is today. And then notion. And, and I think, you know, that I saw this on this, uh, Andreessen Horowitz thing. It's like, um, personality is a feature, not a bug. Yeah. Like people want, like they want to see your typos. They want to know that, you know, you had a bad week. 
Um, and if you just lead with your personality and just add a droplet of value. And again, a droplet of value could just be like, here's a cool story that you probably didn't see. Yeah. Like personality, droplet of value and consistency. And then you will be amazed. I mean, I, I always say I, people always come to me. They probably do to you too. Like I want to start a newsletter. No one makes it out of week 25. No one. Yeah. It's hard. It's, it's not hard for the content. It's hard for just the habit and the consistency. How did you get, how did you do it? How did you get past? Was that the threshold for you? Was that the hard? The um, I think for me, um, there was a lot of, a lot of it was motivated by fear. So it's like, I didn't have an identity, right? I was jobless. And so it was like the one identity I could cling to. So, so that was one thing. Um, but if I really think back on it, like when I take a week off, I miss it. So it is, you know, and, and, you know, when I prep these notion courses, I have fun, you know, like when I make these little loom videos, I'm not like, be like, looking at my to-do list, that would be like, oh, I got to record four Loom videos today. Like, this sucks. Like, I wish I can't wait until it's Saturday. In fact, it's like, no, my wife's like, hey, it's Saturday. Play with your kids. Stop <laughs> making Loom videos about Notion. Um, and so, and I think that, and this is where it really works well if you have a job, um, is that there's no pressure to make money. And so you can just let your curiosity run wild and use a newsletter as your, your little uh, vessel for your curiosity, and then just see where it goes. You have health insurance, you have a paycheck. People don't look at you like some weirdo that left the workforce. Like, <laughs> like take advantage of those things. Yeah. And then you, know, then, then you can go from um, you know, creating value to capturing value. And I, I spent four years creating value and one year capturing. Yeah. Uh, I'm in my early days of capturing now. Not everyone will have the financial where wherewithal to do that. I was lucky for other things that worked out in my life, but um, that's what I would that's what I would add about the consistency. Yeah, and it's funny because this is something we discovered in Rite of Passage, the the online course that that I teach you with David Perel on writing. Is people think about branding and they look at mass market brands. You know, they, they, they just look around, okay, well, who do I know who's doing marketing? And they see, say, like a BMW commercial on TV, right? With that kind of marketing, it's important to be everywhere, right? You're trying to create this pervasive surround sound effect so that when that person, next time they think, I need a car, the first thing at the tip of their mind is a BMW. Um, and it's consistency. You want to be pervasive and you want to be totally consistent. I mean, the science that goes into like, what is the color blue in the BMW logo? How can it look exactly the same in a hundred different contexts? They're, they're trying to trigger things in your brain, you know, certain emotions that are based on consistency with, but the, the, so, so brand marketing, mass marketing type of marketing, the main other school of marketing is, is direct, is direct marketing right? It's direct marketing to people where you want them to take an action. That's like the classic when you would get mail, basically spam, right? And they want you to like sign up for this thing or send money, send a check to this address. And that's what we do with online stuff. Most online stuff, if you're not a big company is direct marketing. Direct marketing is totally different. You know, the consist consistency in, so in the look, like people are always trying to find like, oh, I need the logo. I need my website to be perfect. I need the typeface, all those stuff. That consistency doesn't matter at all. Have it be different all the time if you want. What matters is the consistency you talked about of just sticking with it. Because there's something I noticed too, which is like, there's so little friction to starting stuff online that every single day people are, people love to announce stuff. <laughs> the internet is so, it's just like every day I'm starting a podcast, I'm starting a website, I'm starting a business. It's like, we've become completely numb to announcements, right? Like my best friend, I'll see them on Instagram, announcing a thing, I'm just like, like, you know, <laughs> like I'm not like, I'm sorry to be so jaded, but it's just too easy to announce things. But that has created a situation where the default expectation for all the stuff that's being announced is just, it's going to, it's going to fizzle out in a matter of weeks, mm. right? Maybe months. So you can stand out and really stand out just by keeping going. Yeah. It's so it's so unusual to have someone a year later, you're still doing that. And it's, it's funny, David was telling me, he's like, everyone is congratulating me on Rite of Passage. They're like, wow, it really seems to be doing well. Like, congrats, all these things. He's like, they don't know if it's going well. They don't know the, the, the launch numbers. They don't know 
students are completing it successfully. All they see is that I'm doing it a third time. Still doing it. That's <laughs> incredible. Oh man, I love that. I love yeah. that. Um, well, let's. You and I could talk forever, and we and we will. But uh, I want to open it up to uh, to questions. So. If anyone has a question, unmute yourself and fire away. Um, don't be shy, because I got many. Hey, this is Evan. <clears throat> hey, Evan. Hi, Kay, and uh, hi, Tiago. I have a question here. So, Kay, you were touching upon it earlier. Like, I'm one of those persons that doesn't really have a thing, and I, I think you're talking about. you talk. I like the advice that you shared about. You know, just get started and use your leverage your personality, use your personality. And, uh, and I'm wondering like if you can expand upon that and, and maybe just help with like a starting point. Like, should I really just share about like what, what I'm learning about this month or what I'm up to, or is there like some maybe more structured approach to going about this? Go for it. Yeah, there, I think there's, there's the important thing is what interests you. I mean, what we're talking here about consistency and sustainability. The only thing that I know is sustain that is sustainable is things that that resonate with me, that move me, that catch my interest. Those are the only things that have any longevity. Um, but that said, there are a lot of sort of proven formats, you know. And we teach some of these in our course. Just we give people like a menu. Pick one of these five. Like, you know, one is, um, I mean, the personal update is one, just kind of a letter. It's basically just a personal letter with what you're, what you're doing, what you're up to. Um, another one is links, link blogging it has been around for some time. Is like, what are the five, if you're someone who consumes a lot and you're, you're very divergent, you cover a lot of ground with your interests, you can't even pick one. Link blogging is great because you say, here's the top five links. You know, Tim Ferriss does this, a lot of people do this. Uh, another one is like, is summarizing. You summarize one article that you read that week or one book you read that month. You just turn consumption you're already doing into consumption for someone else that doesn't take them nearly as long. Um, another one is, uh, what are some other common ones, Kay? Like what are, the, uh, what are the newsletters that you stay subscribed yeah, to? I would say, um, so um, curation, and I, I would say link blogging, but link blogging in like the blue link, I feel is getting a little long in the tooth. Again, it's going to depend on your niche, but like I, well, some of my most favorite favorite newsletters are curated Reddit uh, emails of curated Reddit threads because mm. I hate Reddit. I can't stand the site. I don't get it. It's hard for me to know. I'm too old. Um, but if someone says read these eight Reddit threads, it's freaking awesome. Um, someone does that for tweets. I wish someone would do that for streaming TV shows that like that kind of thinks similar to me because I, I don't watch much TV with two kids. I just want someone to tell me what to watch. Um, so th things like that are, are, are obvious ones. Uh, one that's really starting to hit resonate with me is templates. Like if you're good at Google sheets, just like you could crank out a weekly te a template on something like this is how I track my calories. Like 99% of the population, doesn't know how to do that. And the 1% that does is too lazy to do it for others. So you've got total greenfield, PowerPoint templates. Um, I mean, think about what Product Hunt was, right? They just, they just found cool products every day and like wrote about them. So, yeah. so I would say those are, those are uh, all starting points. And, and there's a little story that, that I like that's like, just, it's like, just remember to start. So Childish Gambino and Post Malone, right? Talk about brand and identity. Um, both of those names were created using a rap name generator. <laughs> so think about how iconic both of those musicians are. They basically said, doesn't freaking matter like what my name is. I'm going to push a button. I'm going to take the name that it gives me and I'm going to start. One for them is probably making SoundCloud, SoundCloud, things like that. So I would say like, and, and the last thing I'll say is once you start doing something, and I'm sure you can relate to this, whether you're writing, whether you're link blogging, you just start to see the world slightly differently. Because if you're doing link blogging, every time you read it, you might read an article in the Wall Street Journal and be like, that's an interesting link. And then you'll go to the, phys to the digital version and grab it. You just start to see things differently. I've been thinking a lot about redesigning my website. And so every time I see someone's personal website, I'm just looking at like the placement of the icons and all that. And the beauty of that is it then becomes internalized. So I don't even need to think about doing it anymore. It's just happening while I, while I, while I wake, I guess. 
And I have a question. I think one thing that, sorry, I'm squeezing in a double one. Hopefully that's not cheating. No, but, go for it. Uh, my second question is that one thing that I have that I am hesitant about is that it seems like, this is me probably making it bigger than it seems, but it seems like a commitment to once you get started to keep yourself on a schedule to send an email out maybe on a weekly basis, every two weeks or maybe once a month. And that's something that has held me back because, well, it's like, I guess it, things just seem really busy now. And then I, I feel like, oh, well, I'm not really ready to commit to like keeping myself responsible for a schedule like that. Is that something you two deal with or is that something that's just a figment of my imagination? I'm just gonna jump in here real quick and I'll, be, I'll hit you right between the eyes. How badly do you want it? It's that simple. If you really want it, you'll find that there's, where there's a will, there's a way. I know, Tiago. Yeah, I mean, I, I can't really talk because I never had a schedule. <laughs> <laughs> but in the past few months since taking that accelerator I talked about, um, I've tried to stick to a Tuesday every Tuesday. And I've just, you know, I've just seen like, now that I've been paying more attention to, to email newsletters, like you said, you like, there's something powerful about what you create to really powerfully shapes what you consume. When, when you know where something is going to end up, the things that you consume in the first place really change. Um, but uh, I've just seen the, that consistency is so key. You know what I think it is, is people start to look at you as an authority. Um, and to just take your word for it, you know, if, if you think, if you think about it, like the, the signal to noise ratio, getting the ultimate signal and cutting out all the noise is just to trust someone. Like that, that's what we're hard, hardwired to do as humans. You just have your friend who knows all about, you know, car mechanics. You have your friend that knows all about concerts to go to. You have your friend that and you just like outsource that entire domain of life to them. <laughs> and then when they say, oh, you got to go to this thing, you got to listen to this album, you got to do whatever, you just do it. Um, and now we have the opportunity to do that at scale. I mean, that's, I see that that's what I am for my customers. I am just their authority on productivity. They're, they're allowed, they have the privilege of ignoring all the noise out there. And there is so much noise about productivity by just reading my weekly email. Um, and and, and the, where I picked that up from was Stratechery, which has been a huge inspiration to a lot of us who charge uh, subscriptions, monthly subscriptions because he came into one of the most crowded media markets in the world, which is tech analysis. I mean, think about how many articles every day on TechCrunch, on CNBC, on Bloomberg. Are All free, too. That are completely free and trying to stuff their thing down your throat. And he came in and said, yeah, I'm just going to, as a one-man shop, I'm going to write a daily email that tells you everything you need to know. Like, it was so audacious. And I'm going to charge $10 a month for that. Um, but it's, it's the greatest service. I mean, I, I, I get pleasure out of ignoring TechCrunch and ignoring CNN and ignoring all these things because I know in 24 hours, I'm going to get an email that tells me the real story, tells me what's really happening, not just at the surface. Um, so I've kind of drifted from your question, um, Evan, but you know, a, a reframe here, instead of thinking like, okay, there's an email list, email newsletter, and I have to do it, like expand what you're thinking about. What is the thing you really want to create? Like, is it a business? Is it a product? Do you want to live a completely location independent lifestyle and have passive income coming in every month? Do you want to get like connect with like-minded people around the world, be able to get on a, an AMA every month with 20 amazing people as your job? Like, what is that thing that really is like the juicy thing? And then consider, okay, if we were a hundred years ago, you just couldn't do that. There was just no distribution. Distribution was totally monopolized. Now you have the ability to click some buttons on a computer and write some things and distribute a personal letter straight to the inboxes of however many people you can, you can find. Like see email newsletters as just this incredible channel that's now been opened up to do almost anything you can imagine rather than this like obligation and just thing you have to do just because we said so. <clears throat> okay, thank you so much you two, really yeah. helpful. Thank you, good luck man. Thank, thank you. Next question. Hi. Hey, Hello, hi. Nicole. Hi, Tiago. It's Nicole. And hi, Kay. I'm curious how, and sorry if you can't hear me, it's windy here. It, how you structure your unstructured time and through para. Because when I look at it, I turn into productive mode. But I'm curious more about epiphany mode because that's also uh, productive. 
Yeah, I mean, so let's see. It's all, it's all about unstructured mode. So I, I dedicate um, Tuesday, Thursday, and, and basically the weekend to, to just open and creative work. Um, I, I don't have a single, um, you know, Kay asked me, oh, could you do this day on me on a Tuesday? I was like, nope. <laughs> then ask Thursday. Um, <laughs> if I get invited to speak at a, at a whatever, if it's on a Tuesday, Thursday, no, I, I protect that like it's my children because they are. Um, and on those days, I have nothing scheduled. I wake up late. I sleep in. I just lounge around the house. I don't, you know, change out of my pajamas. I think about things. I go for walks. And then, you know, when I'm inspired that day, I'll sit down and create something. But it has to be totally unstructured. I found if I have one call, like in the afternoon, the whole day is ruined practically. Because the whole morning, I'm just like thinking about the call. And then after, I'm like, oh, well, the day is almost over. <laughs> um, so, so really, for me, like productivity, the whole reason any of this is worth doing you have the structure in 10 percent of your life so that you can be unstructured in the rest if you can't do that if you can't get get structured get organized quickly when needed then ironically all of your life has to be structured and usually what that means is it's structured by someone else it's structured by a boss it's structured by a corporation it's structured by someone who just has more like more, more either authority than you or more self-discipline or is paying the bills um thank you for sharing that yeah yeah i don't know i don't know if that helps at all but it's very helpful it's very cool. helpful I, i'd add i'm not that good at that in that i all it's almost like like i watch a movie and i'm like where's the hero's journey where's the hero's journey and it's almost like i'm looking i'm almost like they, I'm the guy that tries too hard in the yoga class and can't be balanced because like he, he's like thinking about being balanced. Um, but uh, one thing that I have found that has really helped me in the past couple of weeks is that I wake up and I, I wake up well, well before my family wakes up and there's only one rule, uh, 90 minutes with no devices. And it's like dark, everyone's sleeping, I got my cup of coffee. Usually that means like, I can't even read a book on my Kindle because that just sets off like a digital slew of, 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 of way of thinking. And so I usually either grab some random paper book that's on my bookshelf, or I'll just write in my notebook. It's not even journaling, it's like doodling and, and things like that. And so that, you know, it's, it's, it's a little bit more constrained than, than I, I love Tiago's idea. I, I actually don't think I have the discipline to, to do that, to like clear out Tuesdays and Thursdays. But uh, that, that's an approach that I've used, so. My seriously, my, my like one to two year goal is to switch it. If I can get to, I'm in the process of hiring a personal assistant. And like one of the main criteria for success is if I can do Monday, Wednesday, Friday for creative and structured time and only have meetings on Tuesday, Thursday. That's the dream. <laughs> oh, love it. Next question. Don't be shy. I got many more I can ask. Okay, you don't have a chat here, right? No, I I had um I had taken it off for the uh for the course. Um you can't re-add it on the fly, right? I don't think so, no. Okay. Um okay, I'll ask a question. Um para, which is like you said, the the most popular uh thing that you you know you've written. I'd love to hear, I guess, you know, it's been so transformative to me. And then I think back, I'm like, it's four folders. <laughs> <laughs> it's literally four folders. Um, and so I guess I would, I would love to hear, um, you know, like a, a quick kind of origin story of PARA itself. It's also a great acronym um, with the vowel placement. Um, but uh, it also has matching vowels with a, another four-letter meme that is quite uh, popular <laughs> these days. Um, but the um, so the, the the origin story. But I also would love to to for you to share. Like you've seen thousands of use cases of Para. Like where do people get get it wrong or get stuck on Para? Yeah. So origin story is, is very funny. So anytime I I try to come up with a framework or a theory or especially like a technique top down, you know, I think like, what's the ideal scenario or like, what's the, what does the science say? Or like, what is conceptually the most, the most, you know, interesting and then try to like go down into the day-to-day -day stuff. It fails. I end up with this overly complicated bureaucratic 
brittle thing. Every time I just watch people work, like I, I really just, it's my greatest source of insights. Just like stand next to them, sit next to them, screen share, just see the little shortcuts they do. Um, because that is what the human brain is so good at is finding a 20% more efficient way of doing it, you know? Um, and there's, there's something in design called desire paths. It's like in the park where like, you know, there's a, a meandering, beautiful like path, with like little flowers line. And then like through the middle of the grass, there's like a brown streak. <laughs> mm-hmm. That's, you know, designers hate, they hate that sometimes because you ruin the, the, the grass, but that shows what people actually want to do. They just want to get to this from this door to that door. Um, so where this came from was like many people who are tech savvy, I was, and still am my parent, my family's it support. So anytime I, I come home and I, I left home to go to college, you know, when I was, I was 17, 18 and kind of traveled for many years. So it would be long stretches of time. I'd come home and, um, and they'd have an agenda. There was like a whole, a backlog of like, fix the printer, fix the Wi-Fi, fix this, fix that. And I would sit down with my mom who, who is, she really, she really like puts a good effort and likes to use different pieces of technology, but is not native to it at all. And I would sit down at her computer and I was like, how did you even create this chaos? There's like files stuck in places I didn't even know they could be stuck, you know? It was just total chaos. And she also has, a, has this fear of deleting anything, right? Because she has on her computer the, our old homework assignments, the photos, the videos. She's like, that stuff is so precious to her. So the first few times I would sit down, I would sit with her and we would systematically go file by file. Okay, where does this go? Where does this go? Where does this go? Where does this go? It would take hours right? Because we'd be categorizing. What are, what are all the categories? But then one day I sat down, I was like, I had 15 minutes. How can I get her to a functional state, you know, in 15 minutes? And I just said, and I just thought, well, mom, you know, we don't have time to really do our usual thing. So let's just get all of these files on the desktop, the downloads folder documents, put them just as they are into a folder with today's date and then start over and just start with a blank slate. And we did it. She was like, this is perfect. Right. Because I know exactly where it is. It's in that folder. Like organizing things by time is actually very natural. Right. Like if you, th- if you think of a piece of information, often your mind goes to like it was in the summer or it was during this holiday or it was on that weekend. But and then after a few times, we had now a few folders that was like archive this date, archive that date, archive that date. So we made an archive folder and put all the archive dated folders inside that one. That was the beginning. Um, and then a slight improvement on that. The only improvement really was instead of doing it strictly by time, we just did it by project, right? Mm-hmm. She'd finish a project. Usually that's what gets things so chaotic, right? Mm-hmm. To do a project, things have to be crazy. They have to be spread out over your, your digital desktop and your physical desktop. You have to get messy if you want to be creative. But then once that's done, don't spend time organizing that stuff because you'll probably never come back to it. Just get all of it gather it into a project folder and stick that in the archive. And over time, that archive that you build up is your portfolio. It's your resume. It's your knowledge base. It's your history. It's your timeline. Like the history of projects you've done is your work history, except instead of just like it lines on a resume, which no one takes that seriously anymore. You have all the project files. You have the notes, you have the learnings, you have the images, you have the word docs. It's all there for you. That's so cool. I did notice that areas probably, um, get some inspiration, maybe subconscious or, or directly uh, from David Allen's Horizons of Focus. Yes, yes. Yeah, Which, exactly. Yeah. So um, it, just, it, it just grew from there. You know, once you have, so we have projects and archives, and then I, mm-hmm. I noticed some things aren't part of projects. You know, my finances is not a project, it's an area. My health is an area. My car is an area. Um, and so then areas uh, arose, and then it was PAA. Um, and then there was just one last thing, which is just like topics. Like I I wanted to collect things on topics. That was R. Um, and, and really that's, it it emerged totally organically, which is how I know it works. Yeah. And so when, when you watch people use para now, what, what's a common pitfall that you see, uh, in their implementation of it? Yeah. So the, the, the most, so, okay. A couple things first is trying to get it perfect Mm -hmm. as in most things. Um, the, the, the fundamental thing about para is it's fluid. If you're not changing things around, moving notes between notebooks, moving notebooks between those four buckets and editing the names of those notebooks or folders or whatever they are, you're, you're getting it wrong. You're, you're doing the Dewey decimal system of 
personal knowledge management, which works for libraries, doesn't work for people. Like the, the correct, what is the, you know, 3.1.2.4 BA2 slash one, and then you stick the book right there, that, does, that doesn't make any sense for the, on, on the personal level. So trying to get it perfect, you know, they'll say like, oh, I'm still trying to come up with my project list. Dude, just look at what you're working on, make <laughs> folders for each one of those things and stick things in those folders. It will change constantly. Um, this, the second thing is that fluidity. There, there should be things constantly moving. You know, mm -hmm. often things start with the projects bucket just because that's what you're working on like right now. But then, you know, you, you discover an interesting piece of knowledge in your project that likely will go into an area right? Or into a resource. That's a very natural flow from things that are on the table right now. Do you notice, oh, this could be useful for that area, for that resource. Um, and then of course, if you're not completing projects and putting them in archives, that's, that's a whole different problem. And you know, you, you want to, that's the other, that's probably another pitfall is people defining huge projects. I spend mm -hmm. like hours in my course railing on people to make their projects smaller. Mm -hmm. If you're not completing like two or three projects every week, they're too big. Oh, every, two or three projects every week. Yes. Oh, wow. So like launch notion course is way too big. Like way too big. <laughs> I mean, what I have, uh, and this is even stretching it is each cohort, each cohort yeah. of building a second brain is its own project. So that takes, you know, if you include the planning and the post stuff, I have a month and a half. Um, but that's also, so this is another thing. That's because I'm familiar with it. The less familiar, familiar you are with something, the smaller the project has to be. Right. The classic is learn Spanish. <laughs> yep. The number of people who have that on their project list is the same as the number of people who have that eternally on their project list. <laughs> right. That, that is not a, that is not a project. That is an entire landscape of ambiguity and uncertainty that you have to conquer. You have to explore. Um, so I would create an artificial milestone, something like complete Rosetta stone level one Spanish. That is a great first project. That might even be too big. Yeah. You know, complete first five modules of Rosetta Stone level one Spanish. Mm -hmm. And then as soon as that's done, you just, you, you, you trigger the next thing. Okay, you finished level one, now level two, now level three. You did a few levels. You might then want to pivot. And, and, and I would recommend this. You learn, oh, okay, I'm, I'm learning it academically, but I really need to learn the conversation. Suddenly the next project could be, you know, attend five meetings of a local conversation group. One, two, three, four, five. And then you pivot watch an entire season of a Spanish novella. You pivot, right? Like you keep learning. Instead of having this like five year plan that you just follow very like, like a slave, just because past you said that was the plan, you just use each project and the end of each project as an opportunity to change course. Oh, man, I need, to, I need to go in and update some of my projects. <laughs> um. Cool. Well, let me let me go back to the well and see uh, see if we got any if any if that spurred anything. Um, I know you guys have questions about solopreneurship and digital re revenue models and uh, online courses. What do we got? I have a question. Go for it, Joe. Oh. <clears throat> so building your email list. Um, obviously you, you've got a collection of email contacts through, you've built up through the course of life. Um, how do you, how do you strike a balance between, Hey, look at my cool thing that I'm doing that doesn't cross over into spam and being offensive. Yeah. Uh, so spam or being offensive. So a couple things. First, I'd say th those are very fine lines. Um, you know, something you might think is, I'm guessing you're thinking of spam because you're trying to sell something. But as Kay and I were talking a few minutes before this call started, he was, he just sent out a series of emails about his course seven days in a row. And when he stopped, they, a few people said, what happened to the emails? Keep them coming. <laughs> like what you think is, is bothering people often just isn't. It really isn't. I mean, as long as you're being respectful, you're providing value up front, you're not um, being dishonest. Uh, and same thing with offensive. You know, like sometimes there's a difference between being offensive just to be offensive, which is what you see on social media. People just trying to get that attention in the moment. But if you have a big uh, message, if you have something to say, 
maybe offending people is exactly what, what is actually providing value. You know, like I, I have this little Twitter beef now with my, my industry, my field of knowledge management has this idolatry where they worship this guy named Doug Engelbart, who was this engineer in the, I guess, 50s, 40s, 50s, 60s. Um, and they keep using him as an example. They read everything he, he does. They, they, they keep going back to him. And I went on Twitter and I guess I was trying to provoke in this sense. And I tweeted and I knew they would see it because they're my followers. I was like, Engelbart's a dead end. There's no point in reading his stuff. It's boring. Forget it. And it created this entire, someone created a map of it. Like there's my tweet. And then there's like this branching thing with maybe 50 tweets of different people responding. And it was amazing. I mean, it was super amazing because they got super offended, but it was for a productive purpose, which is I, I wanted this to be a wake up call. I wanted to be like, guys, we've had 50 years to try to teach people what a second brain is. If it didn't work using the analogies of the 50s, we need to think of something new, right? We need new metaphors. That's what, that's what my message was. But if, imagine I go on Twitter and just have a really safe PC message. PSA, we need new metaphors to describe personal knowledge management in the 21st century. There'd be no response. No one would even notice. No one would care. So provocation can be a tool if it's done with good intentions, I think. What do you think, Kay? I would say um, I, I'm definitely not a provocateur, um, but I do, I feel very uncomfortable marketing, uh, to Joe's point. I don't like selling people because the base assumption is that you're slimy, transactional, and don't give an F about the person on the receiving end. And it really bothered me because uh, like, uh, one of my biggest existential desires, and, and many of ours, is to feel loved. And so it's like every time you send out an, a marketing email, you're giving someone an opportunity not only to not love you, but to hate you. Um, and it took me a while. I, I, the first the first go around, I was not aggressive. I just like sent one email and like tiptoed back into my corner and just waited and prayed. Um, and then the second cohort where I actually got to uh, listen in on one of, from one of Tiago's teacher where he said, the best marketing is, is educating your user. And I was just like, oh, I could get behind that. I like that. And, you know, I do take some leeway on my subject lines because if they don't open it, they're not going to get the educational content that I've actually worked hard to share with them. So, you know, the day after Halloween, I wrote, I ate too much Halloween candy. That's probably the most aggressive headline that I would uh, use, subject line that I would use uh, for an email. And then the other thing is you always give people the out, right? Like they do not they opted in and they can opt out. And, you know, obviously you have to put in unsubscribe buttons and all that, but they have made a choice to stay and also accepting that some people are just going to disagree with that. And, um, you know, I, I give an example that really hit home is I wrote this testimonial, this, uh, this tribute to a friend who, who uh, I lost last week with the opener of the Rad Reads email. And then right below it, I have like my typical call to action slot. I, I, had a call to action to my course because the only week that I could use the massive email list, uh, you know, on the Saturday cadence to sell the course, three people, they were like, you're a brute. Like you're, you're an a-hole. You open with this moving testimony. Then you try to sell me some online course. Um, and they're, they're entitled to that, their opinion. I thought about it before, but I actually, in that specific case, I was like, my friend who I was writing the tribute to would have wanted me to do that because it's my livelihood. It's actually how I pay my bills. And so it's still, people are still going to be pissed and, and you know, yeah, I have to be okay with that and know, you know, I like repeat to myself, you're not a bad person. You're not a bad person. Like, um, so that's how someone who's not a natural provocateur, um, would go about it. Yeah. Yeah. It's judgment calls. There's really no rule. There's no hard, hard and fast rule. You have to make those decisions as they come. You know, and one thing <clears throat> David mentioned this recently on a po on a podcast we did is like the internet splits people. It, it makes everything into an extreme. So 80% of people will just ignore whatever you're sending. 10% you'll change their life completely. 10% will hate you and think you're the scum of the earth. <laughs> and that's not a ratio. That's not a ratio we encounter in our day to day lives. You know, <laughs> in our day to day lives, like. Like most people, first of all, don't ignore you if you try to communicate with them. It's maybe, you know, a very small percentage that ignore you. Of, of 
you know, most of those who, who listen to you, most will either just be neutral or just tell, respond, or they might just like you. You won't usually change people's lives just by talking to them, but then they also won't hate you. So it's like you, you sort of make this trade off to just have exposure really to a much more extreme distribution of human reactions. <laughs> but, the, but I would also say it's overwhelmingly positive. Yeah. I mean, if I went back, there's gotta be a hundred to one ratio. There must, I would really guess that there's a hundred positive ranging from this was great, nice article to, I mean, weekly I get, as I'm sure you do, Kay, like every single week, if not daily, I get emails that I had a profound impact on people's lives. Sometimes by something I wrote years ago or a video I made or an offhand comment on a podcast or anime like this one. Like, can you imagine what that, that does to my self-esteem and my confidence and my motivation? Um, and then for every hundred of those, there's one person that, and it's usually really not about you. It's almost never about you. I'd say it's you're triggering them for something. You're touching a nerve. You're reminding them of something. You are rep you represent something that is pre-existing for them, and they're lashing out at you because they have pain, you know. And I, and I can even have a lot of compassion that like, if that's the way that they're choosing to express their pain, it must be it must be bad. It must they must really be having a hard time. And I can handle it. I can handle those one in a hundred emails. Um, and I, I do to the extent that I can, usually you can't do anything, but I try to try to respond positively and be a help even to those people because we're just here to serve. Ultimately, that's all we can do, you know? Great. All right. We probably have one or time for one or two more questions. So don't be shy. Tiago's flying from Mexico city to the mainland, uh, right after this call. Uh, yeah, I've got one. Yes, Ben, the yes. most long-standing AMA. <laughs> hey, man. Um, yeah, I, well, I love the concept, the full stack freelance concept. I think it's brilliant. I think it's something that you make possible with the kind of paradigm you've created. I was curious as to who maybe inspired that approach from you. And is there anyone that you look at at the minute who is doing something interesting or innovative with with that paradigm I suppose yeah you know it was it was directly I would, uh, Tiago just give one or two sentences on what the freelance full stack full stack freelancer is oh yeah so if you search full stack freelancer on google or on my blog you'll find uh, the article and I'll add it cool um, and it's basically the idea that in the past you had to specialize because you couldn't do it all you had to find one little slice of the, the value chain. The, the value chain is just the, the, the series of steps to deliver a product or service. And you did just the design or just the copywriting or just the sales or just the you know, manufacturing. But all of the barriers to entry to every kind of tool, every kind of skill, every kind of capability is continuously going down. And I think they're getting to the point um, and others people are noticing this too, like the, that book, the, uh, One Person, One Million Dollar Businesses came out recently. It's just each chapter is a profile of a one person business that does a million a year, right? Or the other one, um, Company of One by Paul Jarvis. There's, there's a lot of thinking going on about this, but you can now do enough of, you might have one kind of specialty, but enough of the other things that you can completely deliver a product or service from the very beginning conception all the way to final delivery which is what can I do, right? Like we do everything, we really, I mean, wear all the hats from like, what should I teach? All the way to like, oh, your credit card needs to be updated. <laughs> um, it's not glamorous most of the time. It's, it's a lot of getting in the weeds and stuff, but it also means you can cap, like really what it's about is capturing as much of the value that you're actually creating as possible. You know, this, this is what I saw in my, previously working in consulting is I would like have an idea. I would like work all night. I would like have a breakthrough or really do something cool. And it would create this incredible impact for the client, for the, for the company. And yet no impact on me. You know, my income didn't change if I had the, the most phenomenal week ever, uh, you know, I didn't get a bonus. Some people get bonuses, but really as an employee, you, you give all that up. You give away almost all the upside in exchange for security. Um, and the inspiration for that was this post called the, the rise of the full stack marketer, 
which has had a tremendous impact on marketing, digital marketing the past few years, because this guy, his name is Andrew Chen, he basically said, as a marketer now, you can do it all. You can mock up a quick design for an ad, you can write the copy, you can, with some basic programming skills, you can you know, get it into Google Ads, then you can do some data science and analyze the results of those ads, and then you can write up your results and present them to the team. You know, in the past, those would have been like 15 different people to, to, to get all that done. Now, the barriers have lowered so you can do it. Um, yeah. Who are, who are people? Oh, so you said um, Paul Jarvis, like people who have inspired you or, or other people doing living the full stack freelancer? Yeah, Paul Jarvis is one. What, what, I, what I really like about him is he's so like curmudgeonly. And I say, I say that in the most affectionate sense. He's like, I don't like social media. I don't do that. I don't do this. I live on an island off the coast of Vancouver. He's like this like log cabin recluse that also probably does hundreds of thousands, if not more than a million per year, just because he's, he's has such high integrity and just sticks to his guns and is so focused on creating high quality things. Um, I mean, the ultimate one is Tim Ferriss. You know, Tim Ferriss, really, he could have taken a very different path. He could have built a media company. He could have done like uh, Gary Vaynerchuk, you know, Ferriss Media, and had teams and teams and teams of people filling an office building, churning out stuff. But, um, and he's had assistance. I'm, I'm sure he, has a, he actually has a staff, but he has focused his brand on himself. Like you look at his interests, they change. He goes from like psychedelics to trauma, to productivity, to like biohacking, to cooking. You know, there's a crazy meandering path that he takes all based on his interests and what you really subscribe to is him as a, as a full stack person. Um, there's tons of, I mean, all the solo creators are following that model. Maria Forleo, you'd say? Yeah. Yeah. Actually. Yeah. I mean, she, she had to, you got into videos, got into writing, got into a lot of things. Um, it's, it's really just that media is becoming easy enough the different kinds of media you can create and the different skills you can have that it's no longer defensible to just stick to one hmm. you know unless you're the world's best expert the p double phd whatever expert in the narrowest thing you have to learn other things just because other people are you know the people who are competing for your market your dollars they're learning how to make little videos on YouTube. They're learning how to write better in our course. <laughs> there, you know, it's, it's, there, there's, what is the, the BOMO cost effect? I think it's called oh, where like yeah. salaries get higher just because other salaries are getting higher. There's, there's sort of a skill inflation that happens also, I think. Cool. Well, with that, we have, uh, we're leaving you three minutes to, uh, to, to get, get to your flight. Um, I want to thank you. Uh, I want to thank you on behalf of our community. I want to thank you as a friend and as a confidant on someone who has really gotten me, you know, I tell you four years in the creating value space and one year in the capturing value space. My playbook has been to follow your playbook. So, and it's working pretty damn well so far. So I think uh, my, me and my family, thank you for that. Um, and, and just lastly, where, um, where can people go uh, to find you, what are the courses that you have kind of on tap right now? Yeah, yeah, I'm really happy to be here, Kay. It's been it's been very gratifying, you know, seeing you just build your 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 empire over time, and uh, I think you deserve it. You really deserve to like capitalize on what you the, this community, this amazing community you've created. Um, but uh, my website is fortelabs.co.co. And that's really the portal to everything. You can find my, my eBooks that I've published, um, my blog, my speaking and workshops. You can find a link to join our community, which is made up of an uh, official Facebook group and a Slack channel. Um, and then the main, really my main thing, uh, despite all those interests are online courses, especially a course called Building a Second Brain, which, was, which is on uh, digital note-taking or knowledge management. It's basically how do you as an individual save all this incredible knowledge and expertise you're surrounded by in a single centralized trusted place so that when you go to create anything or you want to think about something or you want to have a conversation about a topic you have stuff to draw on rather than just trying to come up with something in the moment um, and that's called building a second brain you can find out more about it at building a second brain.com awesome thank you tiago uh we will uh we'll see you soon man appreciate you of course, Kay. Thanks so much. And thank you to everyone for showing up.
All right. Thanks, guys. We'll see you soon. Bye. Bye. <laughs>